that, again, you know, if you, the, the Constitution takes a particular economic policy, um, we should be making that, uh, making that argument. And you know, recently, I don't know if people saw, we wrote an alternative people's budget speech, which we presented the day before. It was, you know, it, it's rough still, but the ideas are, are beginning to emerge. And the second point is just that, you know, you point that the state doesn't have the capacity to manage production. Well, yes and no. You know, what I see in the state is a lot of capacity. The problem is that the elites frequently disorganize the capacity. And even if you accept that there is incapacity or shortage of capacity, nothing is being done to create the capacity. In fact, the opposite is being done. Was being done when we started to close nursing colleges and stuff. So, so how you know how do we press to create the capacity and how do we press for an alternative economic policy that can allow greater redistribution? And again, how do you use the constitution as a, as a claim to make that? The very last point is the leadership different from the Beck leadership, which is what you said. I, I would say yes and no, but not fundamentally in its economic orientation. And certainly, Beck leadership wasn't wasn't clean of corruption, it just cut the ground in many ways for subversion of the rule of law. It just did it in a slightly less open way uh, than is happening with what we see at the present. Ensuring that all the, all the legacies of the past 
or our party dealt with. So some of those le legacies I think we, we know very well. Um, for instance, the issue of limited market competition and economic concentration. Um, as we show in the paper, there aren't many measures of economic, easily understandable me measures of economic concentration, uh, but just looking at the stock exchange, you'd see that uh, pre-94, it was dominated, I mean, over 40% um, represented one conglomerate. So we certainly come from a history of excessive concentration, um, also a history where competition was um, dampened, discouraged, um, or outright excluded um, in terms of um, the majority. Um, there was also extensive government intervention, and I think you did see post-94 a certain way of thinking about government intervention um, that sought to liberalize and to privatize. And in a sense, competition policy will ensure um, that the outcomes of this liberalization and privatization um, take, it, it occur within the context um, of competitive markets. Um, historically, there are also investments in uh, the minerals and energy complex. Um, that have also been well documented. And once again, <coughs> policy going forward, view those um, investments as um, interests to then uh, be privatized and so doing raising revenue for the state, as opposed to continuing with um, uh, those assets as state assets. I mean, that, that was the choice um, that, that, that was made. So we examine um, this record using three case studies. <coughs> Um, case that is looking at competition dynamics in those markets, but also how um, the past, the dynamics of the past, have managed um, to sustain themselves even um, after the state has, state has pushed towards liberalization um, and privatization. And this premise um, that markets could be made to be efficient and in so doing could uh, uh, be supportive of uh, the economic growth. Um, of course, when the Competition Act uh, was enacted, it was an outcome of contestation. So one would see that in the Act, the objectives of the Act are very ambitious. It's to ensure that there's fair and efficient competition in the market um, in order to achieve various goals, including opening up access um, to small businesses, to historically um, disadvantaged uh, business owners, um, to ensure um, that consumers get uh, uh, fair prices, um, to ensure that there isn't um, inappropriate exclusion from, from the economy. So they are quite traditional objectives of competition policy that you would see anywhere else in the world, which is essentially ensuring that markets work for consumers to get efficient pricing. But in South Africa, you also see these other aspirations to say it's not just um, a focused um, approach towards prices and, and market outcomes, but it's also about access to that market and opening up um, access with very transformational goals. So in a sense, one could argue that proceeding from that, you could see how competition policy would ensure that those who've been excluded from the market are able to access it. Those with significant market power, that market power is disciplined. And it's, it's um, exercised in ways that are not detrimental, A, to consumers, but to also other aspirant entrants into the market. So that, that's the theory. Now in terms of the powers that the Act actually gives to institutions, you know, those powers have to do with how you then enforce the competition law. So, for instance, um, competition law covers various um, aspects of economic activity. Um, let's take abuse of dominance. Um, the only way that competition policy would ever really achieve its aspirations is if the authorities are able um, to check um, dominant players and ensure that they do not abuse their dominance. But then there are various tests within the Act that establish what dominance is, tests which establish when um, competition could be said to be lessened in a substantial manner. And in many ways, if you look at those actual tests in the provisions, they're very strict and they set up a very high burden of proof, or, or certainly what we think is a high burden of proof, before one can argue that competition has actually been lessened. So you have legislation with fairly broad um, and ambitious objectives about what the policy should do, but the actual instruments that you have in actualizing that seem to be uh, far more restrictive than the objectives would suggest. Now the legislation set up various institutions, um, the Competition Commission being the investigating body that would then 
look um, at anti-competitive practices, both anticipating them and prosecuting them. And they would have the competition tribunal as the adjudicative body, as a separate and independent adjudicative body that will take most decisions. And so the, com the commission would then present its recommendations and findings and have that check and balance from the tribunal um, to, to, to see if those uh, recommendations are appropriate and can therefore be enforced. Now this is not, this is very different from many other jurisdictions and many other big ones such as the European Union uh, where the, the, the commission is able to make orders and enforce in, without necessarily having that intermediate step. Because the tribunal um, also has a competition appeal court which then has oversight over its decisions. So already um, you have um, these three sets of institutions that are at the core of the system before you even um, move beyond into um, the rest of the legal system, you move into the Supreme Court, you move into the Constitutional Court. So, so there are multiple layers um, of litigation that one has to go through before um, reaching um, definitive findings. And I guess people might ask, what does competition policy actually do? I mean, the, the, the substance of it is to um, prevent anti-competitive mergers. As I mentioned, we come from a history of concentration, and so one would have to be vigilant in ensuring that that concentration isn't exacerbated uh, by further consolidation and acquisition uh, by business. Um, the other core activity is to um, enforce the law to ensure that companies don't engage in anti-competitive practices, which are listed in very specific um, fashion in the Act. So it could be excessive pricing, price discrimination, exclusionary uh, conduct, inducing um, firms not to deal with com competi competitors. So there, there are various um, acts which are seen as anti-competitive, which lessen competition, which um, the abuse of dominance and the restrictive practices provisions would look at. Um, and also um, investigating cartels. I think that's the more popular aspect of our work. Um, to ensure that companies, even if they are separate, um, conspire and find ways to remove competition among themselves, obviously to the detriment of the economy. Now, so far, the authorities are 15 years old. Um, mergers are kind of very uh, routine work that the authorities have to assess. And in many instances, one can say um, the authorities have been successful in blocking major anti-competitive uh, transactions that, that would have um, occurred in, in their absence. Um, they've also been able to impose interesting remedies on transactions that might be problematic, <coughs> including remedies to limit um, employment losses that might arise. Um, the authorities have also been quite successful in uncovering and prosecuting cartels. Um, I think the construction fast track is one recent example of that. However, when it comes to abuse of dominance, and I think this is where you have some of the more um, egregious practices that exclude um, competitors from participating in the market, then you find that actually there have been very few cases, um, in spite of having many dominant firms, um, a lot of anecdotal evidence about how difficult it is to maneuver in the market. Um, well, in 15 years, we've had uh, maybe slightly over eight findings um, of abuse of dominance, and only three companies have actually literally paid fines, um, South African Airways, Fosco, um, Telcom twice. Um, so it's interesting that it's, it's these few companies and also um, all three of them with strong linkages to the state, either having been previously state-owned, um, still partially state-owned or uh, privatized. Food set in terms of um, milling of maize and wheat. Now historically this has been a very regulated sector, starting with, um, you know, from the 1910s of the Agricultural Products Marketing Act and many other pieces of legislation which sought to regulate and support agriculture um, in South Africa in terms of price regulation, in terms of access to finance uh, to farmers, in terms of setting up cooperatives that would um, organize farmers to, to, in their production, um, access to silos, great infrastructure, many um, <coughs> instruments that were put together uh, in terms of supporting agriculture over time. Um, Mid-90s and deregulation came and there was an idea that these markets should function as any other market. There shouldn't be um, 
single channel pricing mechanisms that shouldn't um, uh, be uh, the kind of state support that have been um, historically engaged, or at least the nature of state support um, changed. And uh, so there were abolition of the control boards, um, there was trade liberalization, and all of this meant that, of course, um, in theory, the market would be disciplined by competition in itself, but also by um, imports coming in into um, the country. Um, what we saw then with the deregulation was that there was consolidation um, of some of the old cooperatives into major um, conglomerates, AFRI being a very uh, prominent example. Um, it's, it's recently been bought up by a consortium of international investors, but it's been a very successful um, conglomerate um, coming out of that. Um, there were also then um, organization of the industry into associations that in some ways um, the, con the consolidation into corporate entities but also the associations seem to perpetuate um, the ways in which the industry um, had been treated uh, prior to 1994. In other words, it seemed that the deregulation and the idea of vigorous competition and, and lack of cooperation and open markets was is averted by these other arrangements and consolidations that happened. So that whatever the wisdom or otherwise of the policy, in reality, one can say it didn't even actualize itself because um, the interests in the industry found ways of organizing themselves um, that would be contrary to what um, a, a deregulated market would look like. There was also extensive vertical integration in the sense that some of these big conglomerates would be participating in multiple levels of the value chain so that if you're a new entrant and you're only entering um, in one element of that, so if you're a bakery and, and all you want to do is to become a bakery, you find that you're not only competing with a bakery that belongs to a conglomerate, but you also have to buy your inputs uh, from those same conglomerates. And so there are these structures that, that entrench power and that make it difficult uh, for new entrants to be effective. Um, and of course, the government also then controlled some of that old infrastructure that had been developed with state support. So the silos um, became essentially, of course, privatized, and access to silos then becomes an issue for farmers, for traders, for anyone else um, trying to enter the market. So those who own the processing um, capability and those who own the infrastructure then have power and determine the outcomes um, in the market. And so it becomes very difficult uh, for anyone else to build capabilities um, within this context. Um, the Competition Commission um, then engaged in various investigations um, in this value chain that goes from uh, you know, wheat um, to milling to, to making of flour to, to uh, bakeries that produce bread. And found multiple um, instances of collusive arrangements. As I say, these kinds of arrangements that try to thwart um, competition and also engage in explicit price fixing, um, allocating markets across the country, um, coordinating uh, price increases, exchanging information to ensure um, that these arrangements are being adhered to. And so um, we find national and regional arrangements in Mason, we find national arrangements um, in Wheat. And so in all of this, you find that um, competition is dampened, but also rivals are kept out. For instance, in the um, Western Cape, there's the, the, the famous example of a baker who tried to enter into um, the market and found that they have to contend with these collusive practices, but also um, abuse of dominance type practices uh, where they were being driven out uh, by anti competitive uh, pricing um, to ensure that they, they can't sustain themselves and in, into the market. So in this case study, I think it's generated some of our well-known um, cases in terms of the, uh, the Great Cartel, which involved um, all the major con uh, conglomerates, uh, Pioneer, Tiger Brands, Premier, Food Co. Um, clearly demonstrates how you have this policy aspiration to open up markets and hope that outcomes will be efficient, but the way that corporate power um, organizes and reproduces itself is such that um, you have collusion, you have um, <coughs> industry associations um, that act in ways um, that um, subvert that, so to speak. Okay. Um, fertilizer, um, the, the, the chemical value chain, also um, 
you know, provide similar lessons but from a different perspective. Here you have one dominant player, Cecil, once again developed through um, significant um, state support. And I suppose in its logic and it's in its own incentives, um, it has always been disciplined by um, the interests of the former government, but also the interests behind um, the apartheid state in terms of um, producing fertilizer uh, for our farmers, uh, producing explosive for the mining industry. But there wasn't really a policy imperative um, to develop manufacturing and to develop uh, some of the more uh, value-added processes that could have been the outcome of that chemical value chain. And so you find a company that um, tries to dominate the market through mergers um, that have been blocked. So there was a successful ACI merger um, that was blocked by the previous competition regime, the Cecil Engine merger that was uh, uh, blocked by this regime. So you see the usefulness of competition policy in trying to ensure that um, concentration doesn't um, become excessive. At the same time, on um, the actual conduct of the company as it is, um, and with whatever consolidation it, it also managed to achieve, um, you find that it's driving, a, you find that the way that it provides inputs um, to key manufacturing value chains is problematic. So we've had cases of excessive pricing. Um, we've had cases of collusion. Uh, in terms of even Cecil with some of the more peripheral fertilizer players or blenders uh, in the market that have almost been bought out or incentivized to collude um, as a reward for paying these excessive prices um, that, that uh, Cecil has been charging. So once again, we've had um, significant cases um, there of abuse of dominance. Um, there, was still, there was one that was heard um, last year in, in another market in Parliament. But what you, what you really see, especially in the fertilizer value chains, is that completely new companies that then try to enter into this market, once again, have to contend um, with these arrangements that make it difficult uh, for them to, 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 to participate in the market. And therefore, one has to ask the bigger question as to then, what are the avenues of opportunity, given that competition policy is not necessarily delivering the market outcomes um, that one would, would seek to see. Um, telecommunications is the last case study we looked at in the paper. Um, telecom was privatized. Um, there was the idea of introducing competition in the form of a second network op operator. Um, there was the idea that um, telecom would be regulated to give access to its backboard infrastructure to very added network service providers um, at, a fair, at a fair price. But what these cases also show, demonstrate, is that Telcom managed um, to carve a space for itself um, that preempts competition, um, tries to, it has tried to acquire companies in a way that will make it difficult uh, for Neotel, for instance, um, to offer value added services. Um, there have been major um, complaints against um, the way that it treats value added network services providers, such as you know, uh, internet service providers, including um, web virtual networks and companies, um, who always rely on telecom for its basic infrastructure, but the, the terms of access um, have been found uh, to be exclusionary. So there has been a success for the competition authorities, but I suppose it also, in, in terms of um, eventually running a case, imposing penalties, um, getting major settlements out of it, but it, it took about a decade um, for the cases to run through authorities. And it also happened in a context where there is a regulator who should be ensuring that uh, pricing and access, um, you know, anticipating um, that pricing and access should occur in a fair manner. So that also raises the question of why did the whole regulation framework not pan out? And one that has to look at the incentives of government, which is the policy maker, which is the body that empowers the regulator in terms of resources and its independence but which also find it, found itself in a position where it still maintained an ownership stake um, in telecom and, and the clash of incentives um, seem to have played itself out in a way that telecom ends up um, you know, with all these cases and, and having um, to deal with um, this legacy of um, anti-competitive behavior. So the interesting questions about regulation, uh, which should have um, anticipated these issues, and the competition authorities coming in after the damage has been done to try 
um, and prosecute to deter for, for the future and um, also try to have more competitive market outcomes, but of course um, in, in, in a less, um, in a reactive manner given um, the powers um, of the competition. Of <coughs> so just in terms of then um, what we see, I think I've hinted at some of the, the, the challenges and, and the lessons uh, from this and that you have a policy framework which is premised um, on a particular understanding of how markets work. And I think one could, I guess, um, broadly say that the idea be that markets, if left to themselves, function well, there might be problems that <coughs> require correction at the margins. Uh, but if you just leave it, um, it, it, it will run. And authorities such as competition authorities will ensure, and regulatory authorities will ensure that you know, those corrections are made. But what we see from these studies is that there is um, a past dependency from the past in terms of um, investment and also the concentration um, and the, 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 the market power um, that has been conferred to certain groupings. And to, to, um, to then think that the market outcomes will generate you know, efficient pricing, uh, growth, employment um, is flawed. Uh, especially because those instruments that work at the margin um, have certain limitations to them. So I think that at the lengthy legal proceedings, for instance, that um, corporate interests are able to engage in uh, when, when challenged. Um, you have new players into uh, the market choosing, I think, rationally to rather buy into those existing um, incumbents, monopolies, conglomerates, rather than competing with them and developing their own capabilities simply because they don't have the access to the input, they don't have the access to the infrastructure that is way being bequeathed um, to, to, to those dominant players. And also simply that when they do try to compete, there are all of these other exclusionary arrangements um, that, that block them into the market. So you don't see a dynamism dynam and a development of new capabilities, you just see you know, um, some, some continuation. I think it's the Sakura argument um, that we're making. And so, uh, you know, linking it to the NWW uh, framework um, as, as a final point, um, I mean, we would argue that this idea that you have a limited access order and that you move to a more open access order by these doorstep institutions such as co uh, competition authorities um, does reflect a rather simplistic view of how markets work, how interests manage to um, entrench themselves and reproduce themselves um, in those markets. Um, and also that it's not just about moving from limited to more open access orders, or rather perhaps it is, but doing it means balancing the interests of incumbents um, and entrants and also facilitating um, the development of those entrants and or outsiders in very deliberate ways um, that can't just rely on even competition policy. which is called SWAP. And um, I'd like to thank the organisers for asking me to act as a discussant on this paper because, of course, when you are a discussant, hypothetically at least, you should read the paper closely. And I'm very glad I did because, actually, it's an incredibly incisive and insightful paper. And, I mean, that, that in part obviously comes from the fact that both Trudy and Simon have been insiders within the Competition Commission, but also as well that they're political economists heterodox political economists and that they've brought those tools of analysis to bear on the cases they've been working with, I think in very illuminating ways. Now, in my comments, there are a number of ways we can approach this paper, but in my, my comments, um, I want to take a particular angle and see whether we can bring something out of it for discussion. And the way of framing that angle is actually to start with another political economist, which is an observation of Marx. It's always good to start with Marx. So here's a quote from Marx on the German ideology. Whilst in ordinary life every shopkeeper is very well able to distinguish between what somebody professes to be and what he really is, our historians have not yet won even this trivial insight. They take it, eat every epoch at its word and believe that everything it says and imagines about itself is true. Now, I think one of the really interesting things about this paper, which is implicit, although it's also there in the title, but we can bring out more explicitly, is that it invites us to think about the relationship between, on the one hand, the ideology 
and policy prescriptions of neoliberalism, which have underpinned the South African competition for regime. And on the other hand, the actual functioning of neoliberalism. And here I'm going to define that in the terms of Alfredo Philo, who was here from Cyrus recently, where he describes the, or, or characterizes the functioning of neoliberalism as the system, systematic use of state power to impose a hegemonic project of recomposition of the rule of capital under the guise of non-intervention, and where the process of financialization is at its very core. So what does, the, what does the paper tell us about the relationship between these two things? About, if you like, the expectations and the outcomes. And what does that tell us more broadly about the nature of neoliberalism and particularly its manifestation in post-apartheid South Africa? That's what I want to draw attention to. And I think the paper does it in a number of interesting ways. 